Well, hey, howdy, hi, welcome, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for stopping by to join me today. I really do appreciate it. My name is Ellie, and I'm a witch. And this over here is my teaching assistant, Andy. And today is Monday, and on my channel, that means it is Miss Heard History. And today's history topic is going to be the Prohibition. While I am very excited to talk about the prohibition and history in general. If history is not your thing, I do have two other series on my channel. On Sundays, I talk about cryptids, and on Tuesdays, I talk about true crime. Yesterday, I talked about the cryptids of Arizona, and then tomorrow, I'll be talking about Albert Fish. With that all being said, make sure you guys grab a drink for this video. It is going to be a little bit of a longer one. And uh, if you're 21 and over, I should specify, if you're 21 and over, which... I'm 23, <laughs> for anybody wondering. This is totally fine. But, recommend grabbing a drink. I feel like it might be a little bit cruel <laughs> to all the people that had to go through the prohibition, but... Get your drinks and settle in. So let's go ahead and jump to talking about the prohibition. So something that I didn't know, but likely could have assumed, is that the prohibition is not a strictly American thing, and we actually see attempts to create laws and bans well before they were actually implemented for the well-known prohibition in the 1920s and 30s. But let us first discuss some facts about alcohol and pre-prohibition practices. So I am sure that everyone is aware that there was not always strict laws about who could and couldn't consume alcohol, therefore we hear about children drinking. There were not a bunch of hammered five-year-olds running around town though, and it wasn't because they had a tolerance since birth from all the drinking. The reason that people drank so much, and that children drink, was because the accessible alcohol was beer, which is not what you drink today. The original alcohol content was around 1 or 2%, so you had to drink a substantial amount to get truly drunk, which plenty of people did, but it was cheap and it could be used as a meal replacement that, if drunk in moderation, was able to keep you going without getting you drunk. So just for reference on alcohol content if you're unaware, this wine is 5%. This pre-made margarita mix is 11.2%, and then this hard liquor is 40%. So with that in mind, you can imagine how weak what they were drinking was, and I'm not saying that hard liquor or stronger drinks weren't available, but beer was cheap, and like wine, doesn't require much human intervention to be made. But we do see records going back before the 12th century of people distilling alcohol, Though it wasn't until about 1803 that we see the creation of cocktails. With all that being said, let's talk about the bans on alcohol. So we'll start by talking about the temperance movement. Now, this took place in the 1830s and 40s. It started in the Protestant churches. They initially preached moderation, but eventually deemed drinking to be a sin entirely and pushed for legislation to be created to ban alcohol. The church believed that voluntary abstinence would not work, and that it was too tempting. They weren't the only ones who were outspoken, though. Women at the time had little to no agency of their own, so when their husbands spent long hours drinking at the saloon, wasting money the family didn't have to spare, or came home to abuse their wives, those women had nowhere to go with no money of their own. So by the 1870s, thousands of women came together to demand change. They formed the Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU, it wasn't just women fighting for the ban of alcohol, though, but women who wanted other laws changed. Notably, the suffrage movement was partnered with the WCTU. The groups did make change. They created anti-alcohol educational campaigns that were shown to children in schools across the country. They had partnered with groups fighting for the impoverished, children's education, and safety, and, of course, women's rights. There were changes being made, but not enough to have laws created until they joined forces with the Anti-Saloon League. The Anti-Saloon League was dirty and didn't care about anything but their goals. They used propaganda, religion, and political coercion to get the outcome that they wanted. The end goal? An amendment that banned the manufacturing, sales, and transportation of alcohol. Any and everyone was welcomed in the group if they had the same end goal. This meant that the Anti-Saloon League had members from the Democratic Party Republican Party, progressives, populists, suffragists, the KKK, 
international workers of the world group, and even several popular industrialist journalists, those being Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller Jr., and Andrew Carnegie. The group hit a small speed bump, though, when the Income Tax Amendment of 1913 was created. This meant liquor taxes no longer mattered to the federal government's finances. This didn't sell the group too much, however. As anti-German fervor rose as America entered World War I, the group was able to target breweries run by German immigrants. They pointed to these owners and called them treasonous. And with so many powerful supporters, the government didn't want to challenge the group. So, on January 17th of 1920, the 18th Amendment went into effect. The Prohibitionists had won. They shouldn't have celebrated too soon, though. Mere minutes after the amendment was put into effect, six armed men emptied two freight cars full of whiskey, another group stole four casks of grain alcohol from a government-funded warehouse, and yet another group hijacked a truck carrying whiskey. The issue was no longer creating the law that had been easy enough. Now the fight was going to be enforcing it. So enforcement was originally assigned to the Internal Revenue Service, or the IRS, but was quickly turned over to the Prohibition Bureau. There were, of course, cities and towns and people that cared and followed the law. Initially, there had been a significant decrease in arrests, drunkenness, and a 30% decline in alcohol consumption. However, like every illegal substance, where there's a will, there's a way. The criminalization of alcohol didn't make it disappear. Instead, we saw bootleggers start the illegal manufacturing of alcohol. We saw the rise of speakeasies, secret bars and nightclubs that still sold alcohol, the creation of liquor in private homes, commonly called moonshine or bathtub gin. These were the more secret components of the new laws. However, there was a notable rise in criminal activity, especially gang activity and violence. Bootleggers couldn't operate completely alone. They had to have a group with connections or a gang. Famous gangster Al Capone made an estimated $60 million annually thanks to his involvement in the bootlegging game and the operation of several speakeasies. The violence came from bootlegging gangs attacking each other to limit competition. Though it's not confirmed, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago is thought to have been related to the bootlegging operations. If you're unfamiliar with this event, several men had dressed as police officers and killed a group of men from a rival gang. The country as a whole began to feel the repercussions of the law by the end of the 1920s. As I said before, beer was cheap, and it had enough calories for you to get through the day. When this was taken away from the people, the working class suffered. It was around this time that the U.S. entered the Great Depression, so people didn't have money for food, and now they couldn't even afford a drink that got them through the day. This was not the only issue, though. Restaurants shut their doors, no longer making enough money to keep the doors open with no alcohol sales. Thousands of people died each year drinking toxin-tainted moonshine. And of course, while the government didn't solely rely on the liquor tax for funding, there were benefits to the income. Many states didn't realize until now that those taxes had been going to funding roads, schools, and public benefits. By the early 1930s, people started to think that maybe the ban needed to be repealed. With the Great Depression being so devastating, the people needed the creation of jobs and the tax income that repealing the 18th Amendment would bring. Franklin D. Roosevelt actually ran on the platform of repealing the amendment, and due to that, he easily won the presidency. With this, the 21st Amendment was created in 1933, and it appealed the 18th Amendment, meaning alcohol was once again legal. It was in 1933, with the 21st Amendment, that states were actually allowed to choose to continue the ban, but also set the legal drinking age in each state. Only a few states actually set the drinking age to 21 in 1933, but all 50 states were required to set the minimum legal drinking age to 21 by 1988. The state-by-state -state ban also ended in 1966, when all states finally allowed drinking to once again be legal. As I said, the United States was not the only one that banned alcohol, though. In history, there were bans put in place in Canada, Finland, Hungarian Soviet Republic, Iceland, North Yemen, Norway, the Ottoman Empire, Panama, Philippines, Pitcairn Islands, Russian Empire, South Africa, and the United Arab Emirates. The ban on alcohol is not a past experience only, though. There are still countries that have strict laws or outright bans to this day. Those being Afghanistan, Algeria, Bangladesh, several communities in Canada, Chile, Comoros, Djibouti, Egypt, several parts of India, 
Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Israel, Kuwait, Libya, Malaysia, Morocco, Norway, Oman, Pakistan, Palestine, Philippines, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somali, Sudan, Tunisia, Turkmenistan, Yemen, and the United Arab Emirates. So that's all I have for today. I thought that this was going to be longer. I have three full pages of notes, and I realized about halfway through that I was talking so fast. I tend to do that if I'm excited about a topic, which I love history. This is so interesting because I didn't know all of this. I didn't know that there's, I could have, again, I could have assumed, but I didn't know that there were countries that still have bans or super strict laws or that the United States was not the only one. I had heard of the temperance movement, but I didn't know that it directly led into the prohibition. And I didn't know it was like 70 years, 80 years before our prohibition. I also didn't know that in certain states it was legal for people under 21 to drink alcohol up until 1988, which is only 12 years before I was born, like after my parents were born, which is weird. I thought it was like before my grandparents kind of thing, but it's not, which was super interesting to me. Yeah, it was a super interesting topic and I feel really bad for the people that went through it. Not not on the level of like if you can't drink like you know you're an alcoholic or whatever but all those people that lost jobs or lost their lives over stuff like this or if you were a bar owner or a speakeasy owner i should say if you had a client or a customer come in and order a drink drink it and then you try to give them their tab and they can't pay it you have no repercut you can't do anything because you can't go to the police and say, hey, you know, this person drank alcohol and didn't pay for it. You're both going to get in trouble. And you can't be mean to them because they could easily go to police and let them know that you're running an illegal speakeasy. So, so many people suffered. And then, of course, beer being a cheap source of calories, a lot of people were affected once you stopped being able to to have access to it. And again, the alcohol content was insanely low. You weren't going to get drunk off of a couple glasses of beer. I mean, it's like drinking wine. You can have a couple glasses of wine and still fairly be tipsy. I've had it <laughs> like my fourth glass today and I talk a little bit fast, but I'm fine. So the idea that all these people are getting drunk isn't true. They needed that because it was a meal replacement for them. So, that was super interesting to me. Uh, I love talking about this kind of stuff in history. I just love the older history, especially when it shapes and there was just so many repercussions and people thought, oh, this is a great idea because, you know, less people are going to be drunk, this, that, or the other. And then realize very quickly, there are repercussions that you don't think about because these aren't things that you think about. All that liquor tax, gone. So, the funding was lower. While it didn't directly affect the government, it did affect people living in individual states that no longer had that income. So I just think that is so fascinating. If you have a topic similar to this, or if I missed a country that still has very strict alcohol laws, please let me know. I try to do as comprehensive a list as possible, but obviously we don't know everything that goes on in each country, and there's only so much information that I can find. I'm American. I have my American browsers and while I have NordVPN and all that where I can transfer countries. I don't actively speak another language, so it's it's hard to find that information at times. But yeah, if you know another uh, country or you know a sort of fact I missed about the prohibition, please let me know. This was so interesting to me. I loved researching this. But other than that, if you liked the video, hit that thumbs up button. And if you didn't, hit that dislike button and tell me what you think I could improve in the comments down below or tell me what you think I got wrong. I am very open to being corrected. Uh, none of us are infallible. If I say something wrong, please let me know. I am here to learn, just like everybody else. And with all of that being said, I hope that you guys have a great rest of your night, and I will see you next time. Bye!